Welcome back. It is half past time to learn about the Gloss and Milgram model, so let us get right to that. Let me preface this by a very short discussion of models in general. And many of you might have heard this famous quote by George Box saying that all models are wrong, but some models are useful. This is an important way to perceive the models, to judge the models. So it's always important to remember that none of them really are meant to fully capture the reality, to capture all relevant aspects of reality. Rather, models typically focus on a few factors, on a few specific issues, and by formalizing them, these models allow us to gain, to gain a better insight into how these issues affect um, well, market outcomes, in our case, or uh, the world more generally. So gloston milgram model is a model that simplifies the real world beyond uh, anything you could probably imagine, but it will allow us to get an insight into how informational issues, how asymmetric information affects pricing in the markets and can drive illiquidity in the markets. Now the model works as follows. It is a dynamic model in general, although the problem is separable across periods, so it is sufficient to focus on any single period um, separately. But in general, T will index some periods. In every period, two players are interacting. In particular, we have a long-lived dealer or a market maker. And this dealer is presumed to be more or less the same in every period. But the dealer may face the same or different traders. So in any given period, the dealer interacts with one given trader and uh, for simplicity, we'll just assume that it's a new trader every period. Now, the main feature is that this trader can, can be privately informed about the fundamental value of the asset, or the trader may be completely, completely uninformed. So, let's dive into this in a little more detail. First, we talk about traders and how we model them. We will classify traders by their informedness. So we will say that informed traders are speculators. This is how we'll call them. And the uninformed traders are noise traders. Now, each trader, independently of their informedness, can submit a market order to buy or sell one unit of the asset in a given period. Now, with probability pi, any given trader in any given period is a speculator, meaning that they have private information about the fundamental value of the asset. We assume that traders are risk neutral, so they just maximize their expected profits. And speculators in particular will choose their market order D to maximize expected profit. So they can choose whether to buy one unit of the asset or to sell one unit of the asset or to abstain. The speculator's information is relevant to all market participants. So due to everything that we have discussed in part one of this lecture, speculator would like to hide behind noise traders. Speculator does not want to reveal that he is actually informed about the fundamental value of the asset. He does not want this information to leak to other market participants and to make market participants reevaluate their uh, valuations of the asset, because such a reevaluation would harm the speculator and would not allow the speculator to trade at uh, favorable prices for him. Or render the prices less favorable for him. 
The noise trader, on the other hand, uh, arrives in any given period with probability 1 minus pi, so complementary to the probability of being a speculator. And we say that the noise trader trades for some exogenous reasons. So out of three reasons that we have outlined, noise traders can trade due to their uh, risk needs or hedging needs equivalently, or due to liquidity concerns. So because they need some liquid funds uh, converted from stocks or vice versa. They have some liquid funds that they need to convert into stocks. So importantly, we will just assume that noise traders buys or sells with some fixed probabilities. So we will say that the noise trader buys the asset with probability beta b and sells the asset with probability beta s and with the remaining probability abstains from trade or does nothing. So it's important to realize that even though we are fixing these probabilities, we are not really saying that these noise traders are just use this decision rule, that they flip a coin and this coin decides them, tells them what to do. No, R rather we are saying that these traders trade due to their risk or liquidity needs but we are just not modeling this aspect, this decision, explicitly. And we will say that these probabilities capture this behavior in a reduced form. So statistically, it is likely that share beta B of noise traders would like to buy in a given period due to these concerns. And share beta S would like to sell. And so on. So we are not claiming that these traders are irrational, but rather we are just not modeling their decision processes explicitly. Now let's talk about the trader's counterpart, namely the dealer, or as we will also call him, the market maker. We will also be assuming that dealers are risk neutral in this model, so they, again they maximize their expected profits. They are willing to trade exactly one unit in every period, so they are obliged to be ready to either buy or sell one unit, and they must quote prices at which they are ready to do so. So the dealers set bid and ask prices for a single unit of the asset in every period. Now the dealer quotes price before seeing the trade, but this does not really matter. This does not matter because, as we will argue a little later, the bid price, for example, is only relevant, will only be used if the trader comes to the market with the intent to buy. So bid price will only be used if the trader wants to buy and the ask price will only be used if the trader wants to sell. But the dealer does not know which of these two will be relevant, so the dealer is forced to quote both. Finally, the most important part is the dealer does not know whether the trader in any given period is a speculator or a noise trader. So the dealer only has access to statistical information, but the dealer cannot identify particular traders. Going back, the dealer knows probabilities pi and 1 minus pi, with which any given trader is a speculator or a noise trader. One more assumption is that the dealer is competitive. So the best way to think about it is to say that there is not actually one dealer, as I will be saying throughout, but rather there are many different dealers and they are perfectly competitive. Meaning that if I see another dealer getting some positive profit with uh, their expected quotes, I have an incentive to undercut them just to buy a little bit. So offer slightly better prices to the traders, which will yield me lower profit, but will drive all of that dealer's clients to me instead. 
as we know from basic economics and basic industrial organization, what this will do is render profits of the dealers to zero. So dealers will obtain zero profits in our industry, and in particular prices that they offer will be equal to the expected asset value conditional on the information available to the dealer. Because these are exactly the prices that yield zero profits. Finally, to reiterate once more, we assume that trading is sequential, meaning that uh, there is only one unit of the asset traded in any given period. But one way to see this assumption is to say that uh, dealer basically offers a new price for every next unit, meaning that even if some traders want to trade, say, 10 units rather than one, they just have to submit 10 separate orders of one unit. This is the way we'll be looking at this issue. Now, here are some quotes from rules of NASDAQ stock exchange, which are meant to argue that this representation of dealers in the model is actually quite realistic. In particular, from NASDAQ rulebook, uh, we can see that for each security in which a member is registered as a market maker, the member shall be willing to buy and sell such security for its own account on a continuous basis during regular market hours and shall enter and maintain a two-sided trading interest that is identified to the exchange as the interest meeting the obligation and is displayed in the exchange quotation montage at all times. Now, this is a long and formal and bureaucratic way of saying that the dealer must always quote a price. Not one price, but two prices. The dealer must always quote a bid price at which they would be willing to buy the asset and an ask price at which they would be willing to sell the asset. And the dealers must provide these quotes at all times. From the rulebook of NASDAQ uh, Helsinki Exchange, minimal requirements towards dealers are that at least 85% of the time, bid offer spread must be at most 4%, and the order size must be at least worth 4,000 euros. Pardon that notification. So this rule says that the dealers cannot basically put uh, a quote for literally one stock and say that, well, they met the obligation that they needed to be meeting according to the previous rule that we just read. But these quotes may, must be realistic, sensible. They must be meaningful. And at the same time, these quotes cannot be such that I am willing to buy only at infinity. No, sorry, vice versa. I am only willing to buy for zero dollars and I am only willing to sell this stock at a billion dollars. Because offering such prices while formally would fulfill the, uh, would be a quote, would not make any trader willing to trade at these quotes, right? So what this rule says is that your spread cannot be at most, cannot be more than 4%, meaning that your quotes must be, once again, meaningful, such that traders can realistically be willing to trade at these quotes. So that was a point of order on dealers. Now let's talk about the remainder of the model. So we have assumed that there is one asset, and we will say that there is some fundamental value of the asset V, which is random, so which is drawn from some distribution. And we will assume that the speculators know this fundamental value V perfectly while other market participants, namely the dealer and noise traders, they only know the prior distribution of V, but they do not observe the realization. Now, this is a strong assumption, 
but it does not really matter that much. So not much changes if speculators do not know V perfectly, but instead they just obtain some noisy signal about the fundamental value V. The analysis will be exactly the same. Finally, we have defined a game, vaguely speaking, because we have not explicitly defined the payoffs, but I hope those are more or less clear from the implicit analysis that we've done. So we have a game, almost. What we need to solve this game is an equilibrium concept. And the concept here will be standard. So this is a static game with asymmetric information, so we will be using Bayes Nash equilibrium. What does it mean? Is that an equilibrium in our case consists of strategies of all players, namely dealer's strategy for which bid and ask prices they quote, and the speculator's strategy of how to trade given their information. And so these strategies for them to constitute an equilibrium must satisfy some conditions. They must be optimal for the respective players. Meaning that for the dealer, these bid and ask prices must be profit maximizing. But well, here we skip a step and we mentioned that dealers are competitive. So equilibrium prices will always be those that generate the zero profit. So we just assume straight away that prices must be such that they yield zero profit to the market maker. We will see how it manifests in a second. Uh, but on the other hand, the speculator strategy, the trading strategy, must also be optimal. So the speculator best responds to prices. The speculator's decision to buy or sell must be the one that yields them the highest profit or maximizes the expected gain. So some questions to think about given this model setup. Firstly, why are there no uninformed speculators? So agents who have some information, sorry, who do not have any information, but are profit maximizing. So they are not, meaning that they are not trading for listed, sorry, traders which are not trading for risk or liquidity concerns, but they are simply profit maximizing, but they do not have any extra information. So why do we not have any of these any of such traders in the model and would anything change if we did the second question is why do we even need the dealer could we have traders just trading with each other say that uh, there is some random matching i guess this is already part of the answer which is how do you match the traders and this is one obligation that the dealer implicitly fulfills of matching different traders with each other but what if there is more to it finally the question number three is why is the dealer in this model willing to trade with better informed speculators so the dealer here knows that these speculators have better information about the um, asset value V, meaning that the dealer will always trade at a loss against these speculators. And here I'm not using the zero profit condition for obvious reasons. But basically speculators only trade if they expect to receive zero, uh, positive profit from this trade but speculator's profit is the dealer's loss because it is a zero-sum game, effectively. Meaning that any trade of the speculators that brings them profit brings loss to the dealer. So why is the dealer willing to do these trades? Now, you may think about these questions now or 
you can continue listening with the lecture and you can revisit these questions later and hopefully answers to them will become clear once we do our model analysis which begins right now first of all a few facts that we have already discussed firstly the dealer quotes bid and ask prices on only one unit of the asset and once again, the interpretation for multi-unit trades is that the dealer can revise prices between each incoming trade. Secondly, the prices, the quotes, the prices the dealer quotes are only relevant if the, order, the trade direction chosen by the trader has, uh, is correct. Meaning that the ask price is only relevant if the next trader decides to buy, while the bid price is only relevant if the next incoming trader decides to sell. Together with the risk neutrality and competitiveness of dealers, we get that the zero profit prices should be equal to the expected valuations of the asset conditional on observing relevant trades orders. Tr yeah, trade orders. Namely, the ask price must be equal to the expected fundamental value of the asset V, conditional on all public information existing by that time, and the fact that the trader at time T wants to buy the asset. Similarly, the bid price BT is given by the expected value V, conditional on all public information, and the fact that time t trader wants to sell one unit of the asset now why are these conditioning events relevant for noise traders they are not so noise traders trade randomly and their buy or sell orders are completely excuse me uncorrelated with the value of v however for the speculators buy and sell orders are correlated with V. So the speculators know the true fundamental value V. So if V is high, the speculator would want to buy the asset. And if V is low, the speculator would want to sell the asset. One thing to notice with these two expressions is that both sides here depend on prices, on dealer's quotes. Because the speculator's decision to buy or sell the asset does depend on the quoted prices right for example if the ask price is very very high then the dealer does not want to buy the asset that frequently and only wants to buy the asset if value v is very high and this will affect this expectation and the same for bid prices b So let us start with the speculator and their strategy because it is the easier part of the equilibrium analysis. So in our case the speculator knows V and observes the dealer's quotes AT and BT. The expected profit of the speculator is given by this expression which we call the big pie. Namely if the speculator decides to buy, so DT equal to 1, what happens is the speculator receives one unit of the asset, which is worth V, but loses AT in money, because this is the price that the dealer requests. Conversely, if the speculator decides to sell the asset, then the speculator receives the price BT, but loses one unit of the asset, which is worth V. Obviously, if the speculator decides to do nothing, they receive zero. So, given that this is the profit that the specula speculator receives from different actions, it is easy to see which strategy is the optimal one. Namely, if we assume that the ask price is above the bid price, then the speculator would like to buy when the value V is above the ask price, 
because then the profit from buying is positive. The profit from selling would be negative because V is very large. V is greater than AT, which is greater than BT. Vice versa, when value V is very small, namely less than BT, then the speculator would like to sell the asset because the profit from selling is then positive, the profit from buying is negative, and the profit from abstaining is always zero. Finally, if V is between AT and BT, so the fundamental value of the asset is inside the spread, then the speculator would not do anything because profits from both buying and selling the asset are negative. Now, why did we make this assumption that ask price is above the bid price? Well, this is so that there is no crossover. If ask price is lower than the bid price, then there is arbitrage in the market. Namely, you can buy the asset at price AT, then immediately sell it at price BT and realize positive profit from this round trip. Now, this is a case that we cannot really deal with in our model because we do not have... Here, the trader can only submit one order per period. So such round trip is not possible instantaneously. And the prices might change in the next period. But either way, this assumption on the positive spread is uh, generally very, very realistic. So it's more of a technical assumption rather than a meaningful assumption. So now let us turn to the dealer. As we've argued, the dealers might ma must make zero profit due to perfect competitiveness. And we now know how all traders trade in the market as a function of prices. So this gives us the chance to close down the equilibrium. So for just notational purposes, but not for any meaningful purposes, uh, we let sigma t denote the speculator's strategy. So this is the direction of trade as desired by the speculator. And we'll say that it is one if the speculator wants to buy, and it is minus one if the speculator wants to sell. So it is the same as these directions of trade. The non-integer values of sigmas can represent mixed strategies. Although since it's one dimensional, uh, we do not have enough richness for that. But we will not need that richness anyway. Euro strategies will be more than enough for us. So in our case, a pair of prices, AT and BT, together with the speculator's strategy, Sigma. I'm sorry, I, I just realized that uh, the way I defined Sigma orally does not really correspond with uh, uh, with um, what's written on the slides. So let me do that again. Let me amend myself. Sigma is still the speculator strategy, but it's defined uh, differently. It's defined in terms of probability. So sigma t of dt and v is the probability with which the speculator places order dt if the value is v. So this is a proper mixed strategy. And uh, I probably do not need to say anything more about it. This definition is concise and clear enough. I should have just tried it from the very beginning, shouldn't I? So this strategy sigma t, now the correctly defined strategy sigma t, together with a pair of quotes, constitutes an equilibrium if all of the equilibrium conditions that we've introduced so far hold. Namely that the ask and bid prices solve these two zero profit conditions for the dealer and the speculator strategy sigma t is optimal. And the way to write this is uh, to say that sigma maximizes this expected profit condition. But really this condition is no different uh, than this slide, than what we had on this previous slide. Okay? So we know how this sigma looks like as a function of prices. We just need to 
Now solve these two expressions for the prices to open up these expectations more explicitly. So let us do that. Do not be too intimidated from this, by this slide. It is much simpler than what it looks like. So as we've argued, the orders do reveal information about V because speculators' trading choices are correlated with the actual realization of V. So if we focus on buy orders, we know that if a buy order arrives at the market, then it must have been submitted by either a noise trader or a speculator. There are no other options. So suppose it was a noise trader that submitted this order. In this case, we know that there is no new information contained in this fact, in the fact that the order is a buy rather than sell, meaning that in this case, our new valuation of the asset mu t is the same as it was in the last period. This event, the buy order from a noise trader, happens with ex ante probability 1 minus pi times beta b. Because with probability 1 minus pi, the trader is a noise trader. And with probability beta b, a noise trader submits a buy order. The probability to observe a buy order from a speculator, again from the ex ante perspective, from the perspective of the beginning of the period for the dealer, is given by pi, the probability with which the trader is a speculator, the trader is informed, times the probability that the speculator would like to buy the asset, which only happens if V is greater than AT. So the total probability of observing a buy order from a speculator is given by pi times the probability that V is greater than AT, given all the knowledge that the dealer currently has. Now, the fact that the buy order is coming from a speculator does contain in itself the fact that V is greater than AT, meaning that the expected value of the asset, conditional on observing a buy order from a speculator, is given by this expression. Now, why do we care about this? Why do we care about distinguishing noise traders and the speculators if the dealer cannot distinguish them? Well, because we can actually use this. So recall that this is our expression for the ask price, right? It must be equal to the conditional value of V, sorry, conditional expectation of V, conditional on all the public information, omega t minus 1, and the fact that the buy order arrived in period t. But let us now use the law of total probability yet again and expand this conditional expectation into the sum of other conditional expectations. So conditioned on some sub-events of this conditioning event. Namely, here we are conditioning on event that uh, the arriving order is an order to buy. But the sub-events from which this event is composed are that a buy order that has arrived from a noise trader is, a one, pos is one possibility, and another such sub-event is a buy order that has arrived from informed trader. And this is what the next line writes. So we can rewrite this conditional expectation as a sum of conditional expectation of V on the fact that a buy order has arrived and the trader is a noise trader. As we've established, then the expected value of the asset is just uh, the same as it was. So it's expected value of V is given to the ex ante, the unconditional expectation of V at the beginning of period T. 
And this expectation is relevant with this conditional probability. So this is the probability of observing a buy order from a noise trader conditional on observing a buy order. And this formula is brought to you by Bayes rule. For the second term, we have the conditional value of the asset V, conditional once again on all the standard public information omega t minus 1, and the fact that a buy order has arrived from a speculator, from an informed trader. And we know that in this case, uh, mu t is given by this expression. The expected value of the asset is given by this expression. So this is our conditional expectation of V in that case. And the probability with which this sub-event happens is once again given by Bayes' rule. So this is the probability of seeing a buy order from an informed trader conditional on observing any buy order. Now, if you plug in the, all the probabilities that we know, in these conditional probabilities, we will obtain this following expression. So namely, we know that probability of observing a buy order from a noise trader is given by this term, and the probability of observing a buy order from a speculator is given by this value. So the probability of observing a buy order from a noise trader is given by this expression, and in the denominator we have the sum of probabilities of both events, sub-events. Probability of observing a buy order from a noise trader and the probability of observing a buy order from the speculator. And here the conditioning is uh, omitted for, for brevity. Otherwise, it would be a little more difficult to fit this formula into the line. So we see is that uh, what we see is that in the end our ask price AT would be a weighted average of mu t minus 1, the ex ante market valuation, the market valuation as of beginning of period T, and this conditional expectation, which would be greater than mu t minus 1. As long as AT, no, as long as AT is any value. So this will be, this this expectation rules out some very low values of V. Meaning that this expectation has an upwards pressure on our expectation of V. So in the end, we obtain that the ask price in period T will be greater than the ex-ante expected valuation of the asset. We can do the whole analysis in a completely symmetrical way for sell orders. And we do it in the exact same way. So we look at sell orders that arrive from noise traders. We look at sell orders that arrive from speculators. We set up the, uh, this conditional expectation as the sum of conditional expectations that condition on sub-events. So sell order from a noise trader, sell order from an informed trader. And then we obtain the exact same result. So in the end, here, we will obtain that the bid price will be below the exante valuation of the asset. Because in this case, we condition on the fact with some probability that V is lower than Bt. So we eliminate the highest values of V from consideration. And we'll have the weighted average of the ex uh, valuation of the asset mu t minus 1 and something that is strictly below it. And this weighted average will be our bid price. So in the end, it will be lower than the ex ante expectation of the fundamental value of the asset. So in the end, we have confirmed that indeed the ask price will be above the bid price.
Now, we have used mu-t, but we have not defined perfectly what it means here. So mu-t is the expectation of v after the time t trade order is observed. So that's why mu-t minus 1 denoted the ex-ante expectation of v. So given mu-t minus 1 and a trade order at any given moment, what will mu-t be? We'll have the, that the, this conditional expectation of the fundamental value v after the time t trade order is observed would be given by exactly the ask quote if the order at time t was a buy order. Well, if the market order at time t was a sell order, then this conditional expectation would be equal to bt. If anything, this is exactly how we define these ask and bid prices. But what this implies for us is that the market price will actually be efficient. Meaning that in this Gloston Milgram model, while the quotes in any given period deviate from the ex ante valuation of the asset, the actual price at which the trade takes place is in fact efficient. And of course, by efficiency here we mean the semi strong form, meaning that conditioning on the public information, assuming that the orders current and past are observed by. Um, everyone, by the whole market. But the market price in our setting will not be efficient in the strong form, because that implies that the price must be equal to the fundamental value of the asset. Because the speculators in our model do know the fundamental value of the asset, and their private information must be incorporated into prices, so price must be equal to V. And this obviously is too strong of a notion of efficiency. And you can see that we do not actually get that. Now, I would like to make it clear that the efficiency, even in the semi-strong form, of market prices in this model is a absolute consequence of the fact that dealers in the market are competitive, that they obtain zero profit and do not appropriate any margin of trade. As soon as we make dealers imperfectly competitive, say oligopoly or monopoly, which is the case in the real world more often than not, then you will see that the price, prices deviate from the fair market valuation of the asset due to exactly the dealer's market power. But as long as dealers do not have market power, prices are, in fact, efficient. What we will do now is we will look at a simple example of a Gloston Milgram model in which the value of the asset, the fundamental value V, is binary. And we will be able to give more closed form expressions in this case. So, namely, we will look at a single period, although we will then look at dynamics again. So, we'll just drop subscript t for this example and we will also drop the informational notation omega. As I alluded to, we will assume that v is binary, so the fundamental value of the asset is either high or low and the prior probability that the asset value is high is equal to theta. This assumption on the distribution yields us the ex-ante expected value of v equal to this expression. So here mu is our ex-ante valuation with probability theta asset value is vh while with probability 1 minus theta the asset value is vl. So simple mathematical expectation. And now let us solve this model. We do not really need to derive, to, 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 to devote that much effort to deriving the speculator's strategy because it is relatively straightforward, but we do need to derive ask and bid prices that the dealers would set. 
So let us look for equilibrium with trade, even though there is not any other equilibrium, in fact. But proving that is a bit of a chore, so we will just look for equilibrium with trade purposefully, not caring about whether there are any other equilibrium. What this means is that we will assume that the prices are such that the speculator wants to both buy and sell at different times. Meaning that the bid price is above VL and the ask price is below VH. If one of these inequalities is violated, then the dealer would not be willing to either buy or sell respectively because it is not worth the not worth the price. So if these if these inequalities hold, then the speculator will buy whenever the asset value is high and will want to sell when the whenever the asset value is low. So in our representation with sigmas this strategy can be written like this. So how can we find the bid and ask prices? We just need to use the equilibrium conditions that we had before. And using them, we, we, we will be able to calculate market prices given this speculator strategy above. However, in the very beginning, we did assume that prices satisfy this inequality. So this is an assumption, and we will need to verify that this assumption does indeed hold an equilibrium. So we will need to check that this price that, that this inequality holds once we have found the prices. So in this solution, I adopt a slightly different method from what I just introduced in the slides. So in this general in that general model that we've seen five, ten minutes ago, what I did is I expanded the conditional expectation of the fundamental value V into the sum of expectations of V over the sub-events. So buy orders from informed traders and buy orders from uninformed traders. And then I used law of iterated expectations uh, to get the final, the expected value. Here, I am using a different approach in that I will explicitly calculate the distribution of V conditional on these orders to buy and sell respectively. We can do this simply because uh, our distribution of V is binary. So it is relatively easy to do that. Meaning to find the expected value of V conditional on the fact that the order is by, we simply need to find this probability, pardon that, that VH, sorry, we need to find this probability that V is equal to VH, conditional on the fact that the order is to buy, and our expected value of V, conditional on the order to buy, will be given by this probability times VH plus 1 minus this probability times VL. To find this probability, we use the Bayes rule. And this conditional probability can be written like this. So it's the unconditional probability that the value of the asset is VH times the probability of a buy order arriving conditional on VH divided by the unconditional probability of a buy order arriving. And in our case, the All the, the two unconditional probabilities here are pretty simple. So probability of V equal to VH is just theta. The, prob the conditional probability to buy given VH is given by this expression. So with probability 1 minus pi, we have an uninformed trader who buys with probability beta B. And with probability pi, we will have a speculator who buys with probability 1, again, because V is equal to VH. 
and this is the expression that we will have here in the numerator. In the denominator we have the total probability of observing a by order, and this is again given by the sum of observing a by order given VH and the by order given VL, scaled by the respective probabilities, the unconditional probabilities of seeing VH and VL. So once again, this probability observing a by order is given by this plus the same numerator for VL. So probability of VL times probability of observing a bi-conditional on VL. So plugging everything in, we get this in, in the numerator as we've already discussed. And in the denominator, we will have this plus one minus theta times this, times the probability of observing a by order given VL. And in the end, it reduces to exactly this expression that we have here in, in the denominator. Now we can rearrange this expression slightly, and it will be clear why we do that a little later, but we can rewrite it in this form. So we can single out theta, and we'll have the remainder. You know what? Screw later. I will tell you why we do this now. Here, theta is the unconditional probability of seeing VH. Right? So we see that the fact that we observe a by order increases the conditional probability that the asset value is actually high by exactly this term, which is positive. then you can do the same manipulations for the bid price and find the conditional probability of VH conditional on the sell order. And in the end you will obtain ask prices and bid prices equal to the respective expressions. So as I said, the ask price is given by the conditional probability of VH given by times VH plus 1 minus that times VL. So if we plug in the probability that we just found, we will be able to compute our ask price, and it will be given by this expression. Notably, here we can single out the mu, the unconditional expectation of the asset value. And you will see that the ask price will be given by this ex-ante evaluation mu plus some term which represents exactly the information contained in the buy order. And vice versa, the bid quote will be equal to the ex-ante evaluation mu minus some term, which represents uh, the information contained in the sell order. So recall that this is not quite the end of the road. We still need to verify uh, the condition that we assumed, namely that VH and VL are outside the spread, so that the speculator is actually willing to follow the strategy that we assumed for him, to buy if VH and to sell if VL. But it is relatively easy to verify that this condition does actually hold. I am not uh, showing this proof in the slides simply because it is so trivial. You can do it on your own. But after verifying this condition, we can boldly conclude that what we found is indeed an equilibrium. Namely, these two ask and bid prices together with the speculator strategy to buy if V is VH and sell is V if V is VL. So we have found the prices, we have computed the equilibrium of this model. What does it tell us? Now, recall that the focus of our exploration is illiquidity. Right? So we, knowing these prices, we can compute the quoted spread in this market, which is simply given by the difference between the two prices. And in this... Um, 
slide, it's given by the sum of these two big terms. If you rewrite this sum, this sum slightly, you'll be able to do some analysis on how the spread depends on the environment of the problem. For example, you'll be able to observe that the spread increases in pi, which is the probability of informed trading. So the more informed traders you have, the larger will be the spread quoted by the dealers. Which is exactly the exact consequence of the fact that any given trade will be more informative. Now the opposite will hold for the sum of betas. So the larger is the sum of the two betas, beta b and beta s, the lower will be the spread. For exactly the opposite reason. The more noise traders there are, or the higher is the chance of observing an order from a noise trader, the less informative is any given trade. For some other comparative statics, if we assume that noise traders buy and sell with equal probabilities, we will be able to conclude that the spread is increasing in theta times 1 minus theta. And you can see this value as the degree of initial uncertainty about v. So namely this term is highest when theta is equal to 1 half, meaning that value of the asset is higher or low with 50% chance each. This is the most uncertain state there can be with such binary uncertainty. If theta is very is high, is closer to 1, it means that value of the asset is likely high and with some probability it is low but we are relatively certain that the value is high. Conversely if theta is low then we are relatively certain that the value of the asset is low. And the fact that spread is increasing in this term tells us that the more the greater is the initial uncertainty in the market, the greater is the market spread. Now the the actual fact that the spread is increasing in this term is not 100% trivial simply because you have these terms in the denominator which involve theta. But I promise you that if you do the proper calculations under this assumption on betas, you will arrive at this conclusion. You will be able to arrive at this conclusion. The similar logic actually holds for the distance between the valuations. So the larger is the distance between VH and VL, the greater, again, you might think the uncertainty in the fundamental value of the asset. So this would give us the larger spread, both in absolute and relative terms in principle. And now for something completely different. So let us return now to a multi-period setting. So there are many periods, one after another. In every period, an order arrives and one unit is traded. And assume in this setting that the value V of the asset is persistent. The question to ask is, will we have price discovery in this setting? Will the price of the asset eventually converge to V? And the answer is yes. The trade flow in our model is informative, meaning that every single trade may give you a little bit of information about the true value V, but it is some information about V. And over time, as you accumulate enough of these individual signals, you will be able to learn V with an arbitrary degree of precision. So each order conveys information and the dealer learns more about V with any given order. So in the long run, price PT does converge to uh, V, to the true fundamental value of the asset. Meaning that in the long run, 
prices satisfy strong form efficiency in this model. And the point of order here is that the speed of price discovery does depend on the share of informed traders buy. And the more of them are there in the market, the faster is the price discovery. Meaning that in choosing the optimal buy, if we had such a power, but you can see this as, for example, the strength of regulations on insider trading. So if we could choose buy, we as regulators would have would face a trade-off between price discovery and liquidity. Because price discovery improves with buy, with the number of informed traders in the market, but liquidity is severely impaired by buy. And if adverse selection in the market is strong enough, then the market can dry out completely. In general, we would want to balance these two aspects in some way. So we would want to have market that is both liquid and satisfies some has satisfactory performance in terms of price discovery. But this can be a tricky problem. And this, I think, will be the mood for most of the course. We will be exploring the trade-offs arising in markets and market design, but we will not necessarily be able to give satisfactory answers to how these trade-offs should be resolved. Now, here is one picture I can show you uh, about how prices actually converge to the true fundamental value V. So this is still a binary setting, and here uh, represent there are a few simulations of 100 orders each and each line represents to one simulation one price path on the y-axis we have theta the probability with which the dealer and the uninformed traders think that the asset that the asset is of high value in all of these simulations the actual v is equal to vh so the true theta is 1, or when theta is equal to 1, the price Pt coincides with uh, the true fundamental value V. And you see that in all of these simulations, prices do in fact converge to the true value V. Just, just a small illustration of probability theory. Now, this is probably all that I have to tell you about the gloucester milgram model. Now, it is not the best model that you will ever see. And not, once again, it's not men meant to be perfect. It's not meant to be universal. And this model does have some drawbacks or peculiarities that it is worth keeping in mind. Firstly, this is a dealer model. So we have a centralized intermediary who is able to set prices every period uh, and at the same time these dealers are competitive, which was a very important assumption since, as I argued, it gave us price efficiency. An important drawback of this model is that it is not market clearing. So here are prices are set by exclusively by the dealer, but there is very little pressure from demand and supply. And the total aggregate demand from all traders that are willing to buy the asset does not need to coincide with the aggregate supply produced by all traders who are, who are willing to sell the asset in any given period. In your intro to economics, you saw that this market clearing is actually what is supposed to balance the prices, is what's supposed to determine the market prices. But this market clearing is notably absent from the gloucester milgram model. Later in the course, we will see some models in which this uh, issue is addressed. The final drawback is that only fundamental value matters for traders' decisions in this model, but there is no speculation and no resale, meaning that whenever any given trader is buying the asset, 
they perceive their gain from buying the asset as V. But they do not account for the fact that they will likely want to sell the asset at some future point in time. And they might, in principle, suffer from illiquidity at that future point in time. Less speculation or resale is a somewhat involved uh, issue in general, if you want to consider it deeply. But we will see uh, some simple version of a model with resale when we will be talking about the value of liquidity later on in the course. But in the end, Gloston Milgram model is a very simple model of um, the effect of adverse selection on prices. So it tells us how adverse selection can generate illiquidity in the market, can generate non-zero spread between the bid and ask prices. And the main advantage of this model is that it's simple and it is flexible. The feature that we will be using quite heavily later on in the course when we will be looking at different extensions of Gloucester Milgram model to account for different specific questions. So what did we learn today? We learned that information has an effect on prices and asymmetric information in the society can be one of the factors behind the spread, behind the illiquidity in the market. In particular, prices will react to trades and will reflect the information that is conveyed by market trades. The spread in the Gloucester Milgram model is increasing in the informational asymmetry between traders and the dealer and is also increasing about the ex ante uncertainty about the asset value. On the upside, prices do turn out to be semi strong efficient in the end. And in the long run, you can even expect the prices to converge to their strong form efficient level. Although how long is the long run is an issue that is open to debate. The Gloston Milgram model also illustrates the importance of noise trading. Since this is what keeps the market liquid, and this is uh, basically what improves the spreads, it is easy to see that without noise traders, the spread would be very large and um, the terms of trade for the speculators would be quite unfavorable. Informed speculation on the other hand does increase the spread but it has an advantage of improving price discovery. So it is an open question of it is a non-trivial trade-off of how much informed trading you would like to induce in your market. Now, the textbook does contain some exercises following um, on the Gloston Milgram model. And if you have access to the textbook, you are more than welcome to solve these exercises. So here are two exercises to start with. But more generally, almost all of chapter three is devoted to Gloston Milgram model. So you're welcome to consider other exercises as well. And with that, that is all I had for you today. Thank you for sticking around and I will see you later. Next week, we will be talking about other drivers of illiquidity.